Okay, welcome back, Chemistry 241 guys. We've got, uh, essentially, we're at the end of the road here, right? I mean, we've got two weeks left. Uh, we've got a, a exam coming up a week from today, and we've got a final exam coming up two weeks from today. So things are gonna be uh, moving pretty quickly. So you gotta stay engaged. I know it's been a really long slog uh, being away from campus and being all online, but Dr. Cook and I both agree that, you know, hats off to you guys for staying in there. A lot of you have really worked super hard to, to do really well and you've impressed us and um, thank you for that. We really appreciate it and know that Dr. Cook and I have worked as hard as we possibly can to try to make this as good of an experience as possible. So uh, that being said, we still got a lot of work to do. So please, please, please stay engaged. Don't give up yet. You, you can't, you know, you can't do a victory lap yet. We're almost there, but we got to work a little, you know, we got to really work hard to get there. So anyway, um, what I'm going to do today is a little bit different and so we will have um, a lab activity this week with Spartan but what I thought I would do uh, to try to condense time a little bit and help your workload is I would do my best to combine my lecture for today with the Spartan activity and so here's how it's going to go. I'm going to do my best to keep this short, but what we're going to talk about is pretty involved. So I want you to do your best to keep up, and what I'm going to suggest, and you don't have to do this, but I think it's maybe a good idea, is I want you to digest this in parts. And so what I'm going to do, instead of giving you a regular homework, your homework will be essentially to work on the Spartan Week 2 lab activity. And a lot of you did a really good job last week. I think Spartan was a great way to view the things that were going on in class and, and really think about how you visualize these things. And so what I'm going to do today is go through essentially three different things. I'm going to go after uh, BH3 and connect that to what Dr. Cook talked about in his last lecture because he covered BH3. And then I'm going to take on something that's a little bit more complicated that's really hard to do by hand, but Spartan can tear it up. We're gonna do methane, an actual important molecule, right? And then finally, at the very end, we're gonna do ozone. And ozone will be one of the first ones that I've uh, taken you through with Spartan that has pi bonding involved. And that's gonna be a little bit uh, different and maybe a little challenging. So instead of just watching this all the way through, what I really suggest you do is, is take these three examples one by one and, and make sure you kind of understand what's going on before you move to the next one. Because if you just watch all three and kind of blow through it and you don't understand what's going on, you might be a little discouraged. So really kind of look at, at, at both of these. And so what I, I suggest do is look at one and two, uh, look at the um, BH3 and the methane example, and then jump to the lab activity and see if you can do water and ammonia because they're sort of similar. And then come back and watch ozone and then take on carbon dioxide in the Spartan activity, uh, the lab activity. So maybe that's a, that's a hint. If not, if you want to watch it all the way through, good for you. It's your world. You know, I just teaching it. But um, I, I really hope you can kind of digest this in parts and it might make things a little bit uh, more simple for you. But anyway, whatever works for you. So uh, to jump right in, uh, we're going to talk about... Oh, and by the way, I should acknowledge that, yes, this is on your exam. In fact, I'm working on the problem that deals with Spartan, so make sure you understand what's going on with Spartan. If you don't understand what Spartan's doing or, or what it's all about, please, please, please go back and review the Spartan video lab from last week because it really lays out a lot of the things that um, I expect you to know for this video. If, you, if you're not confident in that material, you're going to have maybe a hard time. And if you're having a hard time, stop, go watch the Spartan video or, re or review it and come back. Okay, so let's dive right in. Um, first thing you got your be able to. So, you know, exam coming up week from today, right? Uh, so make sure you're good there. Um, by the way, Dr. Cook and I will host a review Q&A probably on Friday and some practice problems will be coming your way. But that's another discussion. Um, so pretty simple. We're going to use Spartan today to take on molecules that are probably a little, little bit tricky to take on by hand. And I'm going to start with one that's a bridge. And I think BH3 is a really good example, right? And so Dr. Cook did BH3. I think it's important, right, that we think about how do we deal with BH3. And the first thing you do when you do any kind of MO diagram is please, please, please make sure you have a Lewis structure. If you don't have a Lewis structure, you're, you're, you're just begging to make big mistakes. Um, really, really important. So please make sure we've got boron plus 
uh, three times hydrogens, right? And so in this case, each hydrogen brings one electron, so that's three electrons. Boron has three valence electrons, so we're talking about six electrons here. Uh, boron's gonna be in the middle. You know that it has to be bound through sigma bonds at least. And then here you see, okay, well there are three sigma bonds. Each of those bonds has two electrons. That is six electrons, we're done. And you'll say, well, wait a minute. Um, boron violates the octet. Sure does, because boron can do that. And so uh, it, it does not have an octet. And you can imagine this is probably gonna be what? This is going to be um, electron deficient, right? And if it's electron deficient, it's probably gonna want to do what? Accept or donate electron pairs. Well, it's probably gonna accept uh, electron pair, which means it's probably a good Lewis acid. And that's uh, a really important thing to be able to think about. We've talked a lot about acids and bases in this course, so you should be able to draw these connections. And so what I've done is I think it's important to think about the structure. And of course, this is a, a trigonal planar molecule, right? All the bond angles are 120 degrees apart, pretty simple. Flat molecule, if you look at it, I've drawn it in the, the plane of the paper. And you know, arbitrarily we could put axes on this, but Spartan does a really odd job sometimes of picking the axes, and so I thought I would try to give you the axes that Spartan picked. Again, not important, but you'll see why you might wanna know that later on. So in this case, I've got X and Y in the plane of the paper with X being along that hydrogen boron bond, and then Y being perpendicular to that, nine degrees apart. And then we have Z, which will be perpendicular to the plane of the paper. So that means Z is going in and out of the paper. And I know this is two dimensional, but um, you know we can deal with that. So X, Y is the plane of the paper and Z is coming in and out. All right, if we kind of rotate this uh, 108, or 90 degrees rather, where we move uh, that one hydrogen up and now it's pointing straight at us, you can see it's a nice flat molecule. You can see the relative size of the boron and the hydrogen. I modeled this in Spartan and so you can see kind of what, what the relative sizes look like and the, the bond distances. And so here you can see where, um, in this case, you've got, um, let's see here, you've got the um, z-axis going up and down the plane of the paper, y, so z and x make up, I'm sorry, x, <laughs> excuse me, y and z make up the plane of the paper, and in this case, uh, z is pointing straight up at us uh, in and out of the plane of the paper. So I hope these two views give you a kind of a, a frame of reference for what we're gonna be talking about. And so it's important to think about, number one, can you draw a Lewis structure? Number two, can you kind of think about what this thing looks like in three dimensions? That's kind of important, right? When we talk about the molecular structures. Okay, so what I wanna jump to right away is something that's really important. So for right now, uh, for right now, ignore this blue table. Uh, you can ignore this blue table for now. What I want you to focus on is the Spartan data, right? And so I did hartree fock calculations like we talked about in the lab video, and I've generated this output file. And it's really important that you kind of think about what you're looking at, right? And I went over this in more detail in the Spartan video, but I'm gonna kind of just jump in and do a little review on this one, and I'm gonna move a little bit faster. Okay, so here you're looking at what? You're looking at the MOs. So this is MO number one, two, three, four, five, you know, you careful down here, you got six, I know it's kind of close, seven and eight. So there are three, I'm sorry, there are eight different <laughs> molecular orbitals, sorry, it's a little late when I'm recording this, and the columns tell you which uh, properties of the MO belong to the various MO. And so here you see, okay, first thing you wanna look at are the energies, right? And we said, okay, energies are important, they're gonna be in electron volts, right, that's important. In this case, we're not gonna worry about the eigenvalues. So I'm gonna go ahead and try my best to just, let's not worry about the eigenvalues. If you take PCHEM or when you take PCHEM later on, you'll worry about those. But for right now, uh, we're not gonna worry about eigenvalues. So I'm gonna go ahead and cross those out so I'm not even tempted to, to worry about that. If you've got a marker or something, that's a really good uh, thing to do. Just scribble that out and forget about it. Forget about it, okay. So next thing I wanna do is I wanna say, okay, well, what am I looking at here? I'm looking at these energy values. And remember, ones that have a negative value are gonna be occupied, right? Occupied orbitals are really important. 
Um, so negative, 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 and then positive. Okay, boom. That's really important. When you go from negative to positive, something really important go, goes on. You, you number one, identify the highest energy, right? Because the energies are getting larger and larger, less negative. So the highest occupied, the highest negative energy orbital is going to be your HOMO. And that's really important, the highest occupied molecular orbital. And there's your, now you have a, a boundary, and now you have your first positive, and the first positive is your first empty orbital, that is your lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Really, really important. And then number six is positive, number seven is positive, number eight is positive. So I'm gonna go ahead and label these now. If number five is my LUMO, Number six is my LUMO plus one, number seven is my LUMO plus two, and my eighth orbital is LUMO plus three. And so from now on, I'm gonna to refer to these as LUMO plus three rather than eight, seven, six, because those are really important. In terms of HOMO, you're gonna say HOMO, HOMO minus one, HOMO minus two, and HOMO minus three. So now each column describes the orbital I'm talking about, and now we can look at the rows, and the rows are gonna tell you which of the atomic orbitals, right? The atomic orbitals make up or contribute to the formation or the linear combination of atomic orbitals to form the MOs in the columns, and that's really important. So the first thing you wanna look at is what do we have here? Don't forget, this is what molecule, BH3. Really important, so we better have three hydrogens. So we have one, two, three hydrogens, and each of those hydrogens can only bring the 1s orbitals because those are the only orbital it has that has an electron in it, right? So for hydrogen, the 1s orbital is its valence orbital, right? I don't know why it separates it like this. You know, I don't know why it puts one hydrogen then goes to boron. If it were up to me, I'd put all three hydrogens down at the bottom, but I didn't design Spartan, so you gotta just deal with it. The next one we're gonna look at is boron. Boron's a little bit more complex, obviously, than hydrogen. It starts with the boron 1s, and then it goes to boron 2s, 2px, 2py, and 2pz. And the thing that should really strike you is the fact that we only care about what? We only care about valence electrons. So we wanna get rid of this boron 1s. Just scratch it out. You don't need to be distracted by it. It's a core electron. We don't want to deal with core electrons because, and you see I almost messed up there. Uh, make sure I delete the right one. Um, you do not want to be distracted by the core electrons because they do not participate in bonding in any meaningful way. So don't be distracted by them. So now we can check, right? We can say, okay, we have the hydrogen 1s, the boron 2s, and 2p. We can label the same ones down here so we don't make any mistakes like I did. So there we go, boron 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz. There we go. So now we're set up to look at things. And so then the last thing I wanna do before we really get into the nitty gritty is think about what are these energies look like? What are the relative values? We got, okay, we got stuff in the high 20s, we got, or the positive 20s, we got stuff in the negative 12s, negative 18, and whoa, where'd this come from? Now we got this negative 200. Well, that's, that's kind of bonkers. So whenever you see something like this, it's probably indicative of the fact that it's probably what? HOMO minus three is probably core because that energy is so low. That's a good indicator. You wanna get rid of it because you don't wanna be distracted. The mantra of Spartan, do not be distracted by core electrons, really important. So what I'm gonna do is just to prove it to you, let's go ahead and figure out what orbital we're dealing with here. And so if you look at all these values, wow, these values are really low, right? 0 .006, 0 .00000000006. It looks like this guy is the highest contributor of the ones that are seen, right? So we don't wanna be tricked by that. And what do we do? We forgot that we crossed this out. And so for a minute, I'm gonna get rid of that. There you go, check this out. Boom, 0 .99, right, 999. Okay, so that's important, right? So we wanna look at that. We wanna say, okay, this is the highest contributor. And what are these values? These are the coefficients, right? The contributions, right? This 0.03 is nothing. This 0.0006 is nothing, right? We said before that we these values really need to be above 0.1 or 0.2 to be considered contributing. And I would argue that 0.99, that's almost one, which would be pretty much you know, the main deal, the only thing there, if it's a one. Um, and so this is really high. And remember, this is the 1s, that's a core. 
electron orbital. And so boom, that one shows you that, yeah, that's, that's core electron. So we can get rid of that one. And so I'm gonna go ahead and go back and, and just kind of get rid of this. I'll leave that one there just so you can see it. I should have left it probably before. There we go. And so since we know this is core, we are not gonna deal with it. We're not gonna be distracted by the core electrons. Just don't even worry about it. We're gonna kinda just scribble it in and only worry about HOMO minus two through LUMO plus three. And that's, I hope, a helpful way of kinda thinking about how you want to digest a set of Spartan output data before you even get started. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do and this is just my, my own prerogative when I start doing these kinds of things, is I wanna be able to say, okay, um, I wanna say, uh, you know, what am I worried about here, right? What am I worried? What do I really wanna think about? And what I wanna think about is on each molecular orbital, which atomic orbitals are the most important? And by most important, I mean, which ones have the highest coefficient? which ones contribute the most. That tells you how important they are. So for each molecular orbital, I'm gonna go ahead, and, again, this is my own personal preference, I'm gonna circle or highlight each orbital, atomic orbital for each atom that contributes the most. That way it will help me know what that orbital, that molecular orbital is made of, and that's really helpful. So for this first hydrogen, clearly it only has one orbital and it's contributing 0.27, that's pretty high. The boron, you've got a couple choices here. You've got the S and the P's. Well, looks to me like the P's are zero, so I don't have to worry about those. So the P orbital is the one that's gonna be involved. And then for each of these hydrogens, boom, boom. And so later on when you're filling out your table, this can kind of tell you for each of the hydrogens, obviously, obviously, they're contributing uh, the one S orbital to the MO. And then for the boron, you have a variety of choices, but in this particular case, it looks like you have mostly 2s, and so we can begin to think about what is this gonna look like? Well, it looks like you've got four s orbitals that all have the same phase, they're all positive, and that looks like you're gonna have some constructive overlap, which to me means probably looks kinda like it's gonna be a sigma bonding interaction. So we'll worry more about that later on the next page, but this is what you need to start thinking about. I want you to be able to think about what these are gonna look like as you begin to digest this Spartan data. And I'm just gonna go ahead and do this for the next a uh, few orbitals. I'm going to say, okay, well, that's there. And in this case, uh, the s orbital, the 2s orbital in boron does not contribute. Neither do the py and the pz. In this case, it's a px. And then here you go again. The s's contribute. Now, let's check out this one here. On the homo, you do not have a contribution from this atom. That's really unique. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you do have contributions here, here, and here. And this is kind of a neat one where you have a p orbital and then you have two s orbitals that have different phases. Well, maybe that means one's gonna be negative, one's gonna be positive. They might line up with that nice p orbital and they might give you some bonding there. We'll have to investigate that. This next one, the LUMO is quite unique because this is one where you see what? Zero, 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 whoa. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. You've got this one. So this is the only orbital in this case, what is this? This is a 2PZ from the boron, and that's really neat. And so in this case, whenever you see one atomic orbital all by itself, that means you can't form a bond, right? There's no interaction with anything else. So if you can't form a bond, you sure can't form an antibond. So this is probably an indicator that this is probably gonna be non-bonding because an atomic orbital all by its lonesome can't interact with anything. So it's probably gonna be stuck as a non-participating, non-bonding atomic orbital. And then we can come down here and we can see, okay, there we go there. Ooh, that's one, That's a big contribution, 1.5. There you go. Whenever something's one or higher, that's, that's pretty intense. Like, check this one out. Wow, these are really gonna be swinging for the fences here. Really good, so. And then finally, the last one. Ooh, look at that one, no contribution there. That's a big contribution and then a big contribution here and here. So gentlemen, I hope you can see that these are really important to be able to identify what we're looking at in terms of the individual atomic orbitals that are gonna to contribute to those molecular orbitals. Really, really important. The very, very last thing I wanna do, and this is, I'm gonna pick a different color for this one. Um, one other thing I wanna highlight, and, and this is just the way I do it, 
um, you want to look a little bit at the energies because you want to know which things are going to be low and which things are going to be high. So let's start here. Again, we don't care about this negative 200. That's a core. Don't, don't be distracted by that. So negative 18, that's really low. Negative 12.8, negative, whoa, negative 12.8, what happens here? Ah, oh, check this out. We've got two molecular orbitals that have exactly what? They have exactly the same energy. And what is that called? That's called degenerate, right? And that's really important. And in fact, uh, a little hint, you don't need to know this, but E typically means degenerate. And that's kind of cool. A, if you see A's and B's, that means you're not going to be degenerate. And we'll talk more about that later on. So homo, homo, homo minus one are going to be the same energy. Then you bump up to six, right? Because that's a positive. That's a lumo, an unoccupied molecular orbital. Then you go to 19. That's a big jump. And then check this out. Positive 21 and positive 21. Yeah, those are going to be degenerate. Oftentimes these kind of come in, in mirror pairs, right? Oftentimes you have, if you have too low, you're going to see too high that kind of mirror that. And so again, you see the little E here. And again, the E is not a big deal, but it just gives you a little hint if you know what to look for. And again, not a big deal, but if you see an E, that probably means it's going to be doubly degenerate. Okay. So at this point, we've kind of deciphered or decoded our information here, and now we're ready to begin to build from scratch an MO diagram. And what's cool about the Spartan data is that you can take a molecule that, that could be really, really complex, really a lot of MOs, I mean, a lot of MOs, a lot of AOs, uh, all kinds of stuff, right? And so how do you begin to kind of get a handle on this? And, and so I'm going to kind of show you how you might want to be able to derive a molecular orbital diagram only from the Spartan data. And so Dr. Cook showed you how to work through uh, this before, um, you know, kind of looking at observational approaches and, and, and you can do it with Spartan as well. So hopefully just, this just reinforces what you talked about last time. Okay, so whenever you, you jump ahead and you want to make a diagram, first thing I will tell you, um, as an as old timer who's done this for a little while, Please, 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 please do not repeat. Please do not make your MO diagrams using a pen. Now, you know, you may be all star, you know, molecular orbital jocks, and that's good. But I would just caution you on an exam or a quiz or homework or whatever, please use a pencil because you will often be re moving things around, reorganizing erasing mistakes and if you have a bloody mess of pen scratches and stuff it's going to be hard to read so do this in pencil okay so first thing we're going to do and again you're going to have to kind of uh, use your own notes to kind of go back up to the data because i can't show everything at once so i apologize for that first thing i'm going to do is i need to find out what's participating here well it's what is the molecule it's bh3 which means i've got a boron and I've got three times my hydrogens. And I am gonna typically go with the fact that, you know, on an MO diagram, we wanna have something on one side and something on the other. I typically put the center atom on one side and all the other stuff on the other side. And so in this case, I'm gonna say, okay, well, I'm gonna have a 2s electron, uh, 2s orbital, excuse me, and it's gonna have, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and label that as my 2s, and I'm gonna make sure to put boron down here. And then a little bit higher, right? I'm gonna have my 2p. I'm gonna go one, two, three, because there's gonna be an x, a y, and a z. And boron has three electrons, so I better put those in there. One, two, three. And that's all really important. And then the question I get sometimes is, Dr. Porter, how do I know where, what goes over here? Well, like I just said, we're gonna put the boron, which is a central atom on one side. And then I'm gonna put three times my hydrogens on the other side. I'm gonna group them as three times my one S's, and that's really important. So now, where are these in energy related to these? Well, that's now we will look at that table. And this little table, I wanna be careful with because this is really important, and I will promise to give you this on an exam, so if you want to, well, I guess I don't have to because you have open notes for an exam, but I'll go ahead and stick it on the back of the periodic table but I wanna be really careful here. Last time I told you, and I made a big deal about this in last week, was that Spartan is a simulation. It's a computational, it's a calculational, a computational tool, it's a calculation, right? And so you have to be careful. The data that I have here is experimentally determined. It's not a Spartan calculation. So sometimes these don't agree perfectly. 
I think I tried to give you um, the note that um, Spartan is a pretty good tool, right? It gets the ordering, really well-established ordering that matches the x-ray data that we saw in the last uh, activity. However, it might get the ordering right, but it doesn't always get the energies exactly right. And that's okay, that's okay. But you'll be tempted to, 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 to be disappointed uh, that when you use the experimental data and you try to mix it with Spartan data, it's not going to be exactly the same. And it can give you a little bit of a, um, a, a you know, it can make you dis disappointed. And so what I want to be careful to say here is that I will use this table oftentimes. You don't have to use it. I like to use it because it can help me kind of set up relative energies to begin with. And then once I've done that, I forget about it. I move on to only Spartan. And so let me show you what I mean. So if you look at boron, right, here's boron, we're dealing with boron, and if you go across, you'll see the energy for the 2s orbital is a negative 14, and you can read this little hint over here, and I'll talk about why that is in a minute, and it's negative 8.3 for the 2p, and so you see obviously negative 14 is lower than negative 8, and that's, that reflects what we've done over here, but if we want hydrogen, where does that fit? Well, hydrogen is negative 13.6, which means it's almost exactly the same energy as the boron 2s. So when we draw it, when we set up our diagram, where do we draw it? We don't draw it way up here. If this one is negative 14-ish, and so is my hydrogens, I better put them right about the same energy because that can really help me. So I'm gonna put three times one s, and you know I'm gonna put one in each, right? And these are often called, uh, I'm not going to go into this, but these are often called uh, symmetry adapted linear combinations. That just means we took all the things that were not core atoms and we grouped them together, right? Because if we're adding things together, does the order of the addition matter? No, it doesn't. That's one of the main properties of addition. And so now that I've kind of done this, right, I said, okay, well, these are the right order in terms of this guy over here. And then this guy's energy is about the same as this one. That's pretty good. So all I use this table for is to kind of help me get an estimate, just an estimate of where these orbitals might be relative to each other. And then once I've done that, I forget about that table and I focus on the Spartan data. If you go to a more advanced course, we can talk about some nuances here, but I don't think that's the main thing right now. Okay, now we've got both the uh, boron and the hydrogens with the correct number of electrons, right? It ends up equaling six. And so what do we do first? Well, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna look at the low, I personally like to look at the lowest energy orbital, which is my HOMO minus two. And I'm gonna put this way down here. I like to exaggerate my energies because I like to be able to have room to work. So I'm gonna put this one way down here. And I'm gonna call this, this is HOMO minus two, right? And if you look at this, what is, what is going on here? Well. We've got essentially what? A low line orbital. Remember, low energy orbitals are typically going to be your bonding. That's really important. And what do we what what con, what what contributes to this MO? Well, if this is HOMO minus two, we see that it is contributing from the three hydrogens. So we need to draw parentage lines, as I call them. I want to know what the atomic orbitals are that contributed to this guy. And then we look, we see that no p orbitals contributed, so we don't draw a line there, but we see that the 2s contributed from the boron. So I'm gonna draw that. And there you go. And if you want to, you can draw it. You can say, okay, well, I've got the 2s here, and I've got one, two, three 1s orbitals. And if I do that, I'm gonna get this big blobby of constructive overlap, and that is called a sigma. And since it came from s orbitals, I typically put a little note called sigma s. You don't, it doesn't really matter. As long as you know it's sigma, that's really important. Now, one little pet peeve of mine right here that I'll get out of the way that's really important is that please do not be distracted whenever you have a bond to a hydrogen. A hydrogen cannot pi bond in this course. There are no pi bonds to hydrogen. So don't ever, 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 ever tell me that a bond of something to hydrogen is a pi bond because hydrogen does not form pi bonds in this course. So anyway, so we're gonna call that a sigma bond. Okay, if you move up now, going to HOMO minus one and HOMO, uh, you'll notice that they have, we talked about them having the same energy. I'm gonna put them here and that's gonna be uh, HOMO and HOMO minus one. It doesn't matter the order. 
And so where do these come from? Well, they had to, the S orbitals were involved, so we connect them from hyd or hydrogens, right? Because they had to be involved. There's only one thing over here, and that's hydrogen, one S's. And then we look at it and we say, okay, what, what's involved there? In this case, I see um, not the boron 1s, but what? I see the boron 2p's involved here. So I'll draw a line to the 2p's. And that's really important. And I just want to check, right? If you go back up, right? if you go back up, you'll see for homo uh, minus 1, there is no contribution, right, from the uh, boron 2s. So don't draw a line to it. Same thing with HOMO. You do not draw a line to something that has a zero. That's really important. And so we've got that one knocked out. And we say, okay, that's good. And, and we'll deal with this one more later on, but I'll just kind of give you a sneak preview. This is a sigma bond. And then finally, we say, okay, we've dealt with all of our occupied orbitals. And so now we want to look at our first unoccupied, which is the LUMO. And remember, I hinted at something for you that this one was going to be what? This is the LUMO over here, and this LUMO only has a single AO. And that means it has to be non-bonding. And that's non-bonding because of the fact that it has no one to play with. There's no other orbital to interact. And what orbital is that? That looks like it's the 2PZ on boron. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, if you look at the structure, if you see that we have this molecule, right, and the PZ looks like this, right, I can call one positive, one negative, or you can shade one and not the other, however you want to do it. And these are going to be hydrogen 1s's. Well, these are orthogonal, right? You cannot interact something that's orthogonal, right? If you look at something like this, this kind of side-on interaction, you would get equal amounts of constructive and destructive, so there's no net interaction. No net interaction. So this is what we typically call non-bonding. And so if we think about that, if that is exclusively the 2PZ from the boron, which is this buddy right here, we have to draw it coming straight off because it has not been in it does not interact with anything else that's the 2pz and it did not have anybody to play with so we call that non bonding or you can just put in b that's perfectly fine now please do not repeat do not draw any connection over here to the hydrogen 1s's because there are no orbitals that interact with it it is all by itself so you just leave it as is and then if you go to the next one, you'll see what? If you go to the next one, you go from LUMO to LUMO plus one. LUMO plus one is up here, right? It's gonna be a little bit higher. And this one does what? It is a interaction. It looks like we have obviously some connection here to the, and don't worry about jumping over text and things like that as long as you can tell. There's some interaction with the hydrogen one S's. And then you have to say, okay, do the, two P's or the two S's get involved? Well, it looks to me like the two P's are zeros, so I better connect it to the two S. And so I go ahead and draw my line up here. And again, this is one of those things where please use pencil because if you mess this up, you need to erase. And here you'll see, okay, this is my, well, I should have labeled this as LUMO, right? That's important. This would be LUMO plus one, right? I've got the HOMO down here. I'll go ahead and write that out if you want me to. Um, and then finally, um, I would say this is probably going to be what? If you look at it, this one is almost the mirror image of this one down here. So HOMO minus 2 and LUMO plus 1 kind of have a kinship here. They come from the same parents. If this one is bonding, this one's most likely antibonding. Put that on there and S. And then finally, the last one, right, is going to be your two degenerate um, orbitals. And these are going to be... Um, this is going to be what? LUMO plus 2 and LUMO plus 3. And if you look at the values up there, well, it looks to me like they connect to the S orbitals on the hydrogen for the reasons we talked about before. And I would argue that they interact with the 2P orbitals on boron, but not the 2S. And that's really important. And I would argue that's also a sigma star because in a way it's the opposite um, so if these down here are constructive these would be the destructive 
interactions, which are non-bonding. And here you have um, you know, your basic MO diagram. And I think this is pretty simple. A couple little notes. Um, you know, I think it's number one important that you you get these in the right order, right? Because Spartan explicitly tells you the order. If these are exactly the same energy, make sure you show them side by side at the same energy. Um, if you have a non-bonding, show that it is connected only to um, its parent and not to the other. And then any of the ones that contribute lines need to be drawn. That's really important. The last thing I like to say that's really important is if you have bonding orbitals, they better be drawn lower in energy than their parents because the whole reason you form bonds is why. You form bonds because you want to form low energy stabilizing interactions. So by the same token, if you have antibonding orbitals, they better be way up here. They better be above their parents because they need to be higher in energy. They need to be destabilizing. Really, really important. And then finally, what we can do, a couple of little checks. Remember that this is all addition. So the number, right, number of AOs must be conserved to form the number of MOs. That's really important. So we had what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven atomic orbitals. How many molecular orbitals do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is a critical check. If you do not get that right, go back. You've made a mistake. I often take off a lot of points if you don't conserve orbitals. Really important. And then the same thing with number of electrons. Number of electrons equals what? One, two, three, four, five, six. It better equal six before and after. So we better put these starting from the bottom. One, two, right? These six electrons now belong to the molecule. Three, four, five, six. There we go. We're good. And the last thing we want to do is we want to calculate the bond order. What does the bonding look like here? And that's easy. It's one half the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons. And so if we look at this, it's one half what? Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in bonding MOs minus, uh, no, there are none up here, zero. And non-bonding, you don't worry about them. They don't count because they're neither. And so in this case, the bond order equals three. And if you think about it, in this case, it just doesn't always happen this way, but in this case, the bonds, if you think about it, there are three bonds in the Lewis structure. There are also three bonds here. The thing that's really unique about molecular orbital theory that I think is really critical is that these bonds do not look like this, right? MO theory says, no, Lewis, you may have three bonds, but they don't look like that. They actually are delocalized. That means the electrons are spread across the whole molecule. They're not stuck in these little pairs that we saw before. That's really important. The key difference between Lewis theory and molecular orbital theory is that molecular orbitals tell you that the bond is spread out across the molecule, not just in between. And so that's really, really important that it's a delocalized model. So I hope this is really helpful because it can show you a lot about what's going on in the molecule. And I, I hope this shows you again, a little bit of review of how you come up with a diagram and the finer points of doing one. So the last thing you wanna do is just kind of finish this table. I am not gonna do this whole table because all the data is up there and I've essentially got it for you. Now, you'll notice that some of those LUMOs are kind of crazy looking and I won't make you draw things that are super crazy, but I would expect you to be able to draw some that are fairly easy to look at. And so I'm gonna do a couple with you and then you can do the rest on your own. And so uh, I'll look at home minus two. I like to work from the bottom up. If you look at the energy here, go back up there. I think homo minus two, if you look at that data, it's something like negative, please don't forget signs, negative 18.4 EV, right? The unit's up above, but that's okay. And then the next thing I wanna do is I wanna come over here and I wanna look at what are those orbitals that were involved. And so here I can say that hydrogen number one, right? Hydrogen number one involved its 1s orbital and that coefficient was a positive value and it was 0.28. I know Spartan gives you more decimals, but I don't care. You can even stop at the tens place. It's not a big deal. I typically go to the hundreds. And then I wanna look at uh, a hydrogen number two. It doesn't matter what order you do these in. Hydrogen number two, I got also plus 0.28. 
And then finally, hydrogen number three has its 1s orbital contributing as a plus 0.28 contribution. So these are all fairly uniform contributions. In fact, they're exactly by the calculations the same contribution. Boron, there's only one of those, and it contributes, it only contributes its 2s, and that ends up being about positive 0.55. And if you look at that, right, we can say, okay, you might say blue is positive, I don't care, it doesn't really matter, and if you wanna change your uh, color for red, that's fine, but I would argue if I draw it kind of like this, like this, and like this, that shows me they're all uniform, right? All blue here. If you don't have colors, you can say these are all positive, and signs are really important. And if you want to draw that, it's going to look like this triangular blob of electron density. So I would say this is all constructive overlap, all done with s orbitals, so it's a sigma. Uh, it's a sigma bonding orbital, really, really important. Now these two you can do on your own. I've actually drawn the picture for you, but you should be able to draw these simple pictures on your own as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the LUMO. LUMO's pretty simple. Um, this one has a positive, right? Because it's LUMO, it's unoccupied, so it's gonna have a positive value. Only the HOMOs have negative values down there. And then remember, only the occupied ones have negative values. The positive one here is about 6.5 EV. And which ones contribute? Well, we talked about this. Only the boron 2PZ contributes. And it contributes quite uh, exclusively as the only one that contributes. And if you think about this, right, it is essentially just a P orbital all by itself, right? All by itself. And so this would be a non bonding orbital. And why is it non-bonding? Because it has no orbital symmetry, uh, no orbital with symmetry to match it. And so we talked about this. Everything else is orthogonal to it. So there's no opportunity to bond, no opportunity to antibond. So there you go. It's a, just essentially an isolated 2PZ non-bonding orbital. LUMO plus one, what does this look like? What does LUMO plus one look like? Well, if you look at it, right, you can say, okay, well, LUMO plus one, I think this one is plus 19.7 EV, right? And what, what contributes here? Well, if we look at this, right, we can say, okay, um, well, what do we got? We got, looks to me like we've got a hydrogen number one, right? It contributes its 1s. And this value, I think, if I read this correctly, I get negative 0.7. Seven, seven, okay. And then I can look at the other hydrogens. Again, it doesn't matter what order you do them in. Hydrogen number two, what do we got here? Well, check it out. 1s, also negative 0.77. Hydrogen number three, that gives you 1s as well. And these have exactly the same coefficients, the same contribution, contribution and negative signs. So let's see what boron does. We've got the boron, right? And in this case, the boron is contributing its 2s orbital, but check this out, it's a positive. It's flipped the sign, right? And it's quite a big contribution, but it's the opposite sign. And so when we draw this, we might say something like, okay, we can make the, um, the boron blue, right? If you want to make positive blue, it does not matter to me how you do this. And then you could say, okay, I'm gonna make the the other one's red for negative, so you're gonna get this here, this here, this here, right? We could just call that negative, negative, negative. If you wanna call the boron blue positive, you can do that. Again, it's not charged. This is, these are not charges. It's just showing you the amplitude of the wave function. It's mathematical um, description of the equation for that function, right, of that orbital. So these clearly have done what? They've introduced something really important and that important thing is called what a node, right? And that new node, I'm gonna draw it as a, I don't know, let's see if I can draw it as a purple, I guess. That we've got a node here. We've got a node here. We've got a node here where we change signs. So there's three nodes. That's typically high energy, as you can see. That's why this one's way up in energy. And so how, would, how do we describe this? Well, I would say that this is by definition uh, an anti-bonding not you know there is that is a destabilizing interaction we've got three nodes there that's going to send that energy up and those nodes do what those nodes essentially cut 
in between the two atoms, which means you effectively have an area of zero electron density between two atoms. That is by definition the opposite of a bond, right? A bond is when you have constructive overlap, when you have overlap enhanced um, by between the bond between the two atoms. Really, really important. So this is antibonding. So I hope this kind of shows you what goes on, uh, both from a pictorial point of view and from a molecular orbital diagram point of view. And so the last thing I might mention is the little question down here that I like is, what about HOMO minus three? Well, remember, we looked at that up above. We don't care about it, why? Because that was a core electron. That's a core AO. That's really, it does not, there is no, no involvement in the bonding, right? Only valence, only valence electrons interact. And so if you really wanna think about what that looks like, that is probably what, the boron 1s orbital, which is just gonna look like a sphere. It's gonna be a smaller one, right? Smaller sphere. Um, and so this is a, a core electron, core atomic orbital. We don't care about it, don't care at all. Okay, I know that's a long uh, discussion, I thought it was really important to kind of walk you through one in all the gory detail, because I think this is really a skill that I'm gonna expect you to look at and use on an exam or homework or whatever. And you'll use this skill uh, later on. So um, if, if this one was confusing, you might wanna go back and review how to read the Spartan data or some of your previous notes, but I'll go ahead and pause here for a couple seconds. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and move on, you can. If not, you might go back and review, go ahead and do that. Um, but I would probably, you know, this is about a 50 minute uh, lecture on its own. So uh, if you wanna come back and do part two later on, that's perfectly fine. Uh, or go get a uh, Coke and some a snack or something or pop some popcorn because we're gonna do some more exciting things later on. Okay. All right, part number two. Let's go ahead and dive into something that I think is really challenging. So up until this point, We've dealt with molecules that you could probably do without Spartan. You can kind of look at them, even BH3, right? You can look at borine and BH3 and you could say, okay, well, I could probably figure it out and draw my P orbitals and my S orbitals and get some overlap and all that kind of stuff. That's not always gonna be the case, my friends. And so oftentimes one of the most beautiful things about Spartan is that it can take on molecules that I would argue you probably just can't do at this stage in your, your chemistry uh, uh, learning uh, on your own. Um, and so Spartan can really help you tackle things that are really, really important. Now, you might ask them, well, why don't we just use Spartan for everything and forget all this by hand stuff? Well, you have no business using Spartan unless you understand what the hell is going on with Spartan. And so that's why we kind of walked you through this because if you don't understand what's going on, you have no business kind of looking at this calculation data because you have a responsibility, right? You have to be able to judge, is Spartan giving you garbage or is it giving you stuff that makes sense? And unless you understand kind of the basics, you can't make that call. So what I wanna do now is move on to a molecule that's really important, especially if you take organic chemistry. Methane is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a greenhouse gas, right? And so um, you, gotta, you gotta be able to think about this. And so, uh, it's got some relevance in terms of reactivity and all this kind of stuff. But for right now, I just wanna think about how do we even approach something like this? Well, guess what the answer is? Exactly the same way we did before. You get the Spartan data and we just go at it. And so uh, I'm not gonna do the Lewis structure for methane because I think that's a pretty trivial example. If you can't do uh, methane on your own, you, you got some, some, some things to, to brush up on. Okay, so this one's gonna move a little bit quicker. So here we go. Uh, first thing we're gonna do, right? Uh, it's totally up to you, but I'm gonna say, okay, I've got my orbitals here, right? I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna get rid of those eigenvalues. I don't like those eigenvalues because for right now they are distracting. So we're just gonna get rid of the eigenvalues. And then we're gonna get rid of the eigenvalues down here. All right. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and say, you know what, negative 300, Goodbye, you are a core electron. I'm not gonna get distracted. In fact, I'm gonna get rid of you, scratch, scratch, and forget you ever existed. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of what? I've got hydrogen 1s, I better keep that one. Carbon, oh, that carbon 1s, that's a core electron. Let's get rid of that atomic orbital. We don't need to be distracted by carbon 1s. We're gonna get rid of carbon 1s on both of these 
sets of data, they both these, these groups. And then finally, you've got, I think we're in good shape there. Next thing I, want, I always look for is what? The, probably should have done this earlier, but I wanna get rid of the, the break, or I, not get rid of it, I wanna realize the break. So here's negative, 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 positive. Okay, whenever I have that jump from negative to positive, that lets me find my homo, my homo minus one, my homo minus two, my homo minus three. You'll see here, then we have LUMO, LUMO plus one, LUMO plus two, and LUMO plus three. You'll notice here, this is exactly the same thing we did. No matter how complicated the molecule is, you can do this, this is not tough. Then hydrogen, you got one S, carbon two S, two PX, two PY, two PZ, and this time we have four hydrogens, right? So hydrogen one S, hydrogen one S, hydrogen one S. So there we go, we'll do the same thing down here. You don't have to do this, but man, it helps kind of keep things organized. And I like to keep things organized whenever I can in life. Okay, so there we go. We are ready, but there's one thing we should look at. What's that one thing? The energies, right? Let's look at the energies. Negative 24, that's gonna be low. Negative 14.2, oh, 14.2, oh, 14. Oh, look, to, look at this. 14.2, 14.2, 14.2. These three, these three orbitals, Guess what? They are degenerate and they are triply degenerate. In fact, you can see a little T down here for triply degenerate. They all are exactly the same energy. And then we go to 19.6, oh, 19.6, 19.6, you got it. We've got another match of three exactly the same, triply degenerate. So you can see a little T here can kind of give you a little piece of advice. And then we have a high one. So if you think about it, even before we even do anything formally, you can kind of think about the energies, right? If you look at the energies, you're gonna have one MO down here, you're gonna have three at the same level, you're gonna have three at the same level and one up here, and that's gonna be essentially how it's gonna look. And so you can kind of get a sneak preview, right? You can estimate before you jump into the gory detail. Last thing I'll do, and I think it's probably important for us to do before we jump too far into this, is I'm gonna go ahead and I wanna jump and look at the main contributors, right? And so we can do that, right? We can say, which of these uh, atomic orbitals are gonna contribute? And so if we look at HOMO minus three, we see that we have contribution from the hydrogen 1s, the carbon 2s, and then all of these hydrogen 1s's. Look at that, and I bet you can kind of figure this one out. You see a trend, right? You've done this multiple times now. You kind of should, your ears should perk up and say, I've got four, five S orbitals that have all the same sign. I bet that's going to be a constructive um, sigma bonding interaction. If you look at uh, HOMO minus two, you've got that is a big contribution. I would say the PX is probably not contributing. 0.01, that's pretty small. I'm going to ignore that one. And I'm going to definitely pick the PZ. And I'm going to pick all these guys. And then I'm gonna pick, let's see, oh no, that, in this case, it does not look like this hydrogen contributes. So I'll ignore that one. And I'd say that number up there is kind of low. It's probably up close to zero. And then I've got these three. So it looks like in this case, one of the hydrogens gets left out. Oh, in this case, that same hydrogen gets left out and we're only dealing with this one. Ooh, that one got left out, so only these. And we kind of keep doing the same thing. And you just kind of work, that's, a, that's really nothing. I'll click this guy, yeah, 0.3 is okay, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, and again, my kind of cutoff is roughly 0 0.1. If it's below 0.1, you definitely ignore it. If it's on the border, then you can count it, but I would say, um, you know, you kind of just go through the motions here, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, sure, 0 0.5, yeah, zero, no, no, oh, that one does, that one does, that one does. Uh, that one does, that one does. Boom, these guys are back. In fact, check this last one out, right? You've got a 2s orbital on the carbon that's positive and all these hydrogens around it are negative and it's high energy. I bet you that's anti-bonding sigma, right? Because you're gonna have uh, opposite phase and you're gonna get a lot of nodes. And so you can see a lot of similarities here between BH3 and, and CH4. The one thing you're probably missing is what? I did not see any non-bonders, right? In this case, I did not see a non-bonding. And how do I know that? Well, I didn't see any uh, 
molecular orbital that only showed me one isolated orbital. So this is a little bit different is in the same way. So again, if you can't do this kind of analysis, you need to go back and review a little bit. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump down here now and put this all together or at least try to, and let's construct this diagram. And so we'll look at this and we'll say, okay, um, if we go and put uh, our, we got methane, right? So this is really important, right? We're gonna have carbon as the, the center atom and then we're gonna have four times hydrogen, right? And those are gonna be one S's. So I'm gonna group them separately. And so I'm gonna start with my carbon. Um, in fact, I'm gonna move this up a little bit. One thing that's really important is give yourself room to work when you do MOs. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this a little bit higher. I'm gonna put this here and that's gonna be my 2S and I'll go ahead and put my 2P up here as well, okay. And remember, I'm gonna have X, Y, and Z, and I've got four valence electrons, I believe, for carbon, so there we go. And make sure I label that, and then I'm gonna put my, uh, what, I've got four times hydrogen over here, and you might say, well, where does hydrogen kinda of fit? Well, in this case, um, if you go back and look at that table that I showed you of experimental values, um, Carbon's 2s is about negative 19.5 eV. Um, the 2p is about negative 10, negative 11. Uh, I think hydrogen's negative 13, so it's gonna be kind of right here in the middle. So I'm gonna put that right here in the middle, and there are four of them, right? So there's four times 1s, and each hydrogen brings you one electron, so there you go. And so one thing's important, how many AOs do I have? I've got four, five, six, seven, eight. So I better have the same number of MOs and number of electrons, right? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I better have the same number of electrons at the end. Really, really important to think about that. As it seems, this looks like a really challenging problem, but it's pretty easy. If you look at the data, what's our first MO? Well, our first MO in terms of going low to high is what? It's the HOMO minus three and it's gonna be way down here in energy. So I'm gonna put this one down here and I'm gonna call it HOMO minus three. And who participated? Well, obviously the hydrogens from the, um, the surrounding, uh, the outer electrons, or sorry, the um, outer atoms, right? The surrounding atoms have to contribute or there's no way to bond. Now, we have a choice to make. Is it the P or the S? Well, if you look at this one, I would say it's the S. And so the P's did not participate in this case. Boom. And if you move to the next one, what do we have? We have, in this case, one, two, three, and this is gonna be homo minus uh, two, homo minus one, and homo. It doesn't matter what order you put these in, they're same energy. Uh, they had some contribution, all of them didn't contribute, but at least some contributed with the hydrogen side. And then it would be the P's, I believe, right? You had PZ, P, X, and P, Y contribute to form these. And I would argue that all of these are gonna be sigma bonding. And we can kind of see if that's true in a minute. And then finally, you're gonna say, okay, well the next one that we have is gonna be way up here. And if you think about it, this is sort of the, uh, you're gonna have what, LUMO, LUMO plus one, and LUMO plus two, right? And that is interacting with the hydrogens and it's interacting with the two P's. This is probably the opposite of these guys down here, so I'm gonna call these the sigma star, and the last one that's kind of missing is this one lonesome guy all up here by itself. This is LUMO plus three, which again is interacting with the hydrogen one S's, and then, oh man, we're gonna have to draw this line way down here. This gets kind of messy, but it's interacting with the two S, right, there on, on the carbon. It's kind of the opposite of this one down here. So here you had a constructive overlap. Here you're gonna have a destructive interlap, overlap in the form of a, pi, a sigma star. And so you can kind of see here, you have constructive down here, low energy bonding, destructive up here, high energy anti-bonding, and there you go. And here we have eight atomic orbitals that give us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've conserved our orbitals, and now we can fill in the electrons, and I'll go ahead and do that in a different color. We can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Bond order, right? The bond order is one half and bonding minus antibonding. So one half uh, 
we had what? We had eight minus zero because none of these were filled up here. So the bond order equals four, which if you think about it, it, it matches the number of bonds in the Lewis structure, but that's a little deceptive because remember the bonds are actually not localized. They are delocalized across the entire molecule, which is really the distinction again for MO theory. So if you think about it, we did this really complex molecule that I think you would have a really hard time doing on your own in less than 10 minutes. Pretty, pretty simple. I mean, it really shows you the power of Spartan. And then I might ask you, how would you predict if this means anything? What's the support for this? Well, maybe you could go out and take the X-ray photoelectron spectrum for this and see if the ordering, and you would probably see what? If you looked at the X-ray photoelectron spectrum, right, you could say, Here's a uh, number, of, number of counts or number of electrons. Here would be the energies, right? And if you're going uh, low to high, you would have a peak for one, right? A peak at one high, right? And then you would have, uh, or you, you could say a peak for two high, and then you're gonna have a peak that's three times as high, right? So this would be two to six, right? or three to one, doesn't matter, and you would have two peaks. And that would indicate that for this molecule, even though you have four molecular orbitals, these three are exactly the same energy. So they would kind of line up and give you one big peak for six electrons. Whereas this one peak down here that's even lower is only gonna give you two electrons worth in terms of a ratio. So you can connect it to real world data and see if this makes sense. So I hope this is something that can help you. Help you. So as practice, I want you to kind of fill this in. Now, granted, I've drawn some of the harder ones. And again, um, you know, for an exam or something, maybe I would do something like this where I would give you some of the information, but not all of it, right? And so let's go ahead and jump in. Let's just do HOMO minus three and then we'll move on. Well, HOMO minus three, I got something like negative 24.8 EV. And what contributed? Well, if you look at it, if I look at that one, I think hydrogens number one through four all contribute their 1s, and I think they contributed with a value of positive 0.18 in terms of its contribution, right? And then the carbon contributed what? It contributed a 2s, and it was also positive. Pretty big contribution from that carbon. And so the carbon's carrying a lot of the weight for that bond if you think about it. And so if these all line up, you've got the carbon here, one hydrogen, one hydrogen, one hydrogen, and one hydrogen. That's going to give you this really cool kind of blob of constructive overlap. And that's going to be definitely a sigma bonding. In fact, you could probably say sigma S to show you that it's all formed from a um, overlap of uh, the S orbitals. So pretty cool. And then I'm gonna let you work on these others. Um, now, don't forget here, I'm sorry, that should have said that's a negative value because that's a homo, right? All the occupied, right? Occupied, occupied better give you negative values for, so you know that's a negative, you know that's a negative, and you know that's a negative, pretty simple. And you can see the pictures here. Some of the pictures I've drawn for you to save you a little bit of time. And if you look up above, we'll do one that's maybe a little challenging. I don't think it's that challenging. Again, all the unoccupieds, right? All the unoccupieds are gonna be positive, 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 positive. And I think this one's positive 20.7 EV. And if you think about it, hydrogen one, or number one through four, contribute their 1s, and that value is, in this case, a negative. 0.67 and the carbon is contributing its 2s and it has oh check this out it has the opposite sign of about 1.63 so if you think about this if the carbon's a positive i'll just pick blue as my positive we can make the negatives red look at that there we go and you know i'll just put a negative if that makes you happy again just to reiterate, that's not a charge, that's just the amplitude of the wave function. And really importantly here, uh, look at all these nodes we've created. One, two, three, four, four, four nodes. Nodes equals about four, right? That's really high energy, right? High energy, you form nodes between the atoms. You've quite literally 
found an area with zero electron density between the two atoms. That is the opposite of a bond. That is a, an antibond. So we call that an antibonding sigma uh, from s orbitals. I'll call it an antibonding sigma s. So really good. Now, I will warn you that you will only find what kind of orbitals here? You will only find sigmas because you cannot have a pi bond. Say it with me, no pi bonds to hydrogen. Really, really important. So don't forget that. So uh, go ahead and uh, you know make sure you can do this on your own. So you know pause for a few seconds and finish this one out. All the data is up above. You know you get this data from the the Spartan highlights that I've shown you up above. So all you got to do is really copy it and think about what's going on. Again, don't just copy it and move on. Copy it and think about it. Be thoughtful about this. Think about what's going on. You want to learn this. You just don't want to blow it off and move on. Really, really important. Again, complicated molecule, but you could do it. Not that bad. All right, the last one. Okay, here we go. Um, if you want to take a pause, I think at this point, uh, why don't you take a take a breather? Uh, you know, if you need to go get a drink of water, use restroom or something, go ahead and do that. And then I would argue that you have everything you need to know right now to go ahead and do both water and ammonia in your homework slash Spartan activity. And again, that's due on Thursday, but don't don't put it off. Um, you know, everything you need because again, I'll give you a little hint. Both water and ammonia are gonna have all sigma interactions, although there might be a non-bonder hiding in there somewhere, so you might wanna take a look at that. Um, but you're gonna have only sigmas and non-bonding because again, anything bound to hydrogen will not be a pi bond. Really, really important, really important. So, what if we did something really crazy now? Oh, I'll go ahead and pause and let you go ahead. Okay, back. Um, so this is the last part, and this one will go by pretty quickly, so don't freak out. This is not gonna be that bad, but what if you wanna do something even more complicated than um, uh, 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 methane? Well, you can do something with what? Well, what was the trick we've seen so far? We had one central atom that had both P and S's, but the outer atoms only had S's, so it made things really easy because what happens if you have things with p orbitals on the outside? Well, you've increased your number of orbitals that you have to worry about by three times the number of external atoms that are outside atoms that you have. And so here's an example of ozone, right? Ozone is a, a really uh, a bad pollutant, right? And so uh, for, for like if you have ozone and NOx gases in your, your automobile exhaust, however, Ozone in the atmosphere is really good because it can pre protect us from the harmful uh, ultraviolet rays, right? And, and depletion of ozone was and still is a worry, but it used to be really bad when we were putting all kinds of junk in the air, although we're still doing some of that. Um, so, you know, ozone is an important molecule. But if you look at it, let's, let's do a Lewis structure first. So go ahead and pause the video. And in this box over here, draw the Lewis structure. I think that's something you should be able to do pretty simply. Go ahead and pause the video and do it. Don't cheat. Come on. Don't 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 gravy train. Come on, you can do this. Really important. Okay, I'll pretend you pause. Now I'll go ahead and give you the answer here. So okay, you got three oxygens, right? Each oxygen has six electrons in its valence. So six times three is what? 18 electrons. Really important. Okay, so we know that we have to have a central oxygen and we have to connect it. That gets rid of how many? Four, right? Okay, so at this point you're gonna have to think about, okay, well, I, I have 18 minus four, so that's 14, so I need to put the electrons on the outside, right? Give everybody an octet on the outside. So there we go, so I had 14 minus 12, and that's what, two left, so I'll put them on the central atom. And you'll notice that oxygen does not have an octet, so that means I probably need to go ahead and make a double bond somewhere. Uh, because I have to. Again, don't make double bonds just, oh, it made that one go away. Don't make double bonds just because you want to. Make them only when you need to. So I'll put my double bond there, and that looks good. However, I need to look at my formal charge. I've got a negative on this oxygen and a positive on this oxygen. However, overall, it's neutral. Now, why did I make the double bond over here? Well, I don't know. Uh, I just felt like it. I could have also put it over here. So that means, guess what? We got resonance we got to deal with. And so if we don't think about that, we're gonna be in big trouble. So we need to think about resonance, right? Now, again, make sure you got 18 electrons. 
So on this side, it's gonna be a negative and in the middle it's a positive. And so in essence though, this was a problem that we dealt with before with Lewis structures. Which one's right? Both, neither? Well, neither are correct. And what probably actually really looks like what reality is something where you have a partial you know, double bond. So maybe like a bond and a half. Well, we'll see today, uh, if you haven't seen already, that we can form a pi bond that's delocalized across this whole thing. And then guess what? We don't care about resonance because molecular orbital theory doesn't care about localized bonds. It cares about spreading the bonding across the entire molecule. And that's the beauty of MO theory is that it can really explain things that have a fraction of a bond. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that later. But for right now, just realize that uh, we need to think about what this looks like. And so uh, right now, you'll see that with that lone pair up here, right? If you have a lone pair, it's gonna make this look bent and it's not gonna be perfectly linear. So that's really important. The other thing you're gonna notice is, oh my God, look at all this doubt, this output. It is a mess and you might be fearful of it. And you're like, I can't do this. Well, of course you can, right? There are a couple of things right off the bat that can make you feel better, right? Number one, what can we do? We can get rid of some things like what? We can get rid of things like core electrons. We don't care about core electrons, right? Because that's a negative 500, negative 500. Oh man, there are a lot of core electrons here. Negative 500, we don't care about that. And those came from the oxygen what? The oxygen 1s's, so we can get rid of all this garbage. There we go. We also get rid of the eigenvalues, right? We don't like the eigenvalues. Not right now anyway. Okay. There is the oxygen 1s. We don't want to deal with that. There's another oxygen 1s. Let's get rid of this bad boy. We can get rid of the oxygen 1s on the third oxygen. Boom. And so basically we're like, get rid of this mess. These guys are of no use to us. And then we want to scroll down, right? I know it's kind of a pain because we got a lot here. And don't let this freak you out. We're not doing this whole thing because it would be a lot of uh, time that we really don't have, but you could do it, right? You could take this whole output and I bet you, you could work on your own and you could come up. In fact, if you want to challenge yourself, uh, you know, if you want to challenge yourself, go ahead and come up with the MO diagram for the whole thing. Uh, that would be a really impressive thing to do and really would show your skills. Um, there we go. And we keep going here. Almost done. Don't worry, we're not, for right now, I'm not going to make you do this whole thing unless you really want to. But I really want to show you what happens when we get a big old scary molecule that we have to deal with. Well, maybe we don't want to deal with the whole molecule, but maybe there are a few different molecular orbitals that we do care about. And if we do care about them, maybe we need to focus on just a few. And what's really important here, remember the energies? Yeah, when you go from negative to positive, that's really important, you need to see that. And so now what we can do is we can go ahead and we can say, okay, this is homo, all right? This is lumo. This is LUMO plus one and LUMO plus two. Here's HOMO minus one, and you keep working your way backwards, right? Here's HOMO minus two, HOMO minus three, H minus four, H minus five, H minus six. See, it, it's just more work, but it's not that hard. And you kind of keep working all the way back to HOMO minus seven, and our lowest lying candidate negative, uh, homo minus eight, really cool. So you can do this. If you wanted to, at this point, you could, as a fun, really challenge yourself, kind of, you know, beat your chest and say, I can do this. You could come up with the whole thing from this Spartan data. Now, obviously I'm not gonna make you do that on an exam because that's too much work for right now, um, but you could do it. What I wanna do instead is I wanna focus on a couple of them. I'll circle them. I'm gonna focus on homo minus eight. I'm gonna focus on homo minus six. I'm gonna focus on homo minus four. And I'm gonna focus on probably the most important ones Homo and Lumo. Remember, Homo and Lumo are important because you want to always think about that Homo Lumo gap. Remember, you can actually calculate that. Um, really important. Okay, 
And then remember, you should be able to do stuff like this, right? We just did this, so I'm not gonna belabor the point, but you know, you should be able to kind of look at an MO and say, okay, for this auction, well, this one is clearly the PY is the most important. Check this out, nobody participates on auction two. And then you've got auction number three. Now, here's the thing that's also a, a big indicator. If you if your central atom, if your central atom has no contribution, what do you think that probably is? Uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, I bet you know though. <coughs> Non-bonder. Uh, anyway, and then Lumo, right? You've got this one here, you've got this one here, and you've got this one here. These are exactly the same skills we've developed in the last few examples. So this is nothing new. It's just that you have to begin to kind of cherry pick things that you really care about. So I'm going to jump to the next page and I want us to kind of think about what these might look like. Okay. So I've drawn some pictures here and I'm going to start down here. I'm going to start with home minus four and you've got your Spartan data so you can go ahead and, and play along at home. But the first thing I'm going to do is just like we did before, right? I'm going to look at home minus four. And I'm gonna say, I think I had, it was like negative 17.8 EV. And I'm gonna go ahead and list which ones I care about here. What, which ones do I care about? Well, oxygen number one, it contributes what? It contributes a two PY, and that coefficient is positive 0 0.37. I'm gonna look at my central atom, which is oxygen number two, and that also contributes a two PY, and that is also a positive, but wow, it has a big contribution. It's like 0.76. And then finally, the last one is oxygen number three. It's also contributing a 2PY in this case, and it matches the first one, kind of symmetrical there, 0.37. And you can see that here, right? You can kind of see a P orbital here, a P orbital here, and a P orbital here. And what do you notice? the blue, right, the positive overlaps and you form a big constructive area of uh, area of constructive interference up here and a big area of constructive interference down here. Now you've done this before. You know what a pi bond looks like. Pi bonds are above and below, right? Above and below overlap. But check this out. Here's the beauty of MO theory. And and you know, this is really amazing. Here you have a pi bond that stretches across three atoms. That's a delocalized pi bond across three atoms, and that's really cool. And so I would argue this is maybe one of the first examples you've seen of a pi bonding MO, of a, a large one on a polyatomic ion, or polyatomic atom, or molecule, excuse me. So very, very really cool. All right, we'll move up to HOMO here, and this one was negative 8.8 EV. And what do you notice here, just by looking at it, there is no contribution from this center guy. So why did that come about? Well, it looks to me like you had a node that happened to hit that atom. And guess what? If a node hits an atom, what happens to the orbitals on that atom? They go to zero across the board. If a node hits an atom, no interaction. So guess what? If this atom is essentially dead and these two orbitals are way apart, what kind of interaction do you think they're gonna have? I would argue not much, if any. So let's go ahead and just double check this here. So here we have auctions number uh, one and number three, and they both contribute uh, two PY and one, right? Auction number one is a negative 0 0.71, and auction number three has a positive 0 0.71. So what does that show you? What well, shows you here that the signs are flipped, right? You've got a positive and a negative, negative and a positive. So they're not aligned to really interact at all. Plus you've got this node going through the whole thing, so they can't really feel each other. They're too far apart. And I would argue in that case, is there a bond? No. Is there an antibond? No. It's a non-bonding orbital. This is a, a good example of a non-bonding interaction because these two isolated atomic orbitals can't interact one way or the other, so it's non-bonding. You can't bond, you can't antibond, it's non-bonding. And then the last one up here, I think, is probably pretty obvious. You're going to have a positive, right? There's our LUMO, right? LUMO is a positive, 2.7 EV. And it's pretty simple here. If I look at my oxygen number one, it's going to be, what, a 2PY. And it's going to contribute. And, and I would say also oxygen number three does the same thing, 
2PY, and they both contribute a negative 0.61. The central atom, oxygen number two, gives you a 2PY, and that is a positive 0.67. So if you look at this, what you've got, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, what does that scream? Well, that screams a node or two. So I'm gonna draw my node like that. Whenever you go from negative to positive or positive to negative, that's a node. I see a node here. So to me, you've got now a number of nodes equals two. Down here, nodes equals one. Now I'm talking about number of new nodes, so there you go. And I would say that this, my friends, is definitely high energy deconstructive overlap. This is gonna be not a pi bonding interaction, but a pi star, a pi anti-bonding interaction. So here you can see an example, as you go from low energy, right, negative 17 or negative 18, you get constructive overlap, no new nodes. And then here you have, uh, you bump it up to negative nine, you have one node and a non-bonding interaction. And as you go to two nodes, you're up to positive three at this point. So you're beginning to see essentially, as you increase the number of nodes, right, the energy goes up. And it's more likely that you're gonna have antibonding orbitals in the high energy situation and bonding orbitals down in the low situation. And these are examples of pi. So why can they be pi? Because everybody has p orbitals, and that's really important. Because you can't form a pi bond in, in this class unless you have p orbitals everywhere. Really, really important. Pi, above and below, really important. All right, the last page. I know you're probably getting tired of me uh, if you haven't done so already, but I'm gonna look at two more. I'm gonna look at homo minus eight, and that was what? That was a negative 44.8 EV. That's one of the, I think that's the lowest energy. And if you look at this, oxygen number one and number three, give you what? Um, a 2s, right? And they each give you a contribution of 0.0, or sorry, 0 0.32. The central atom, oxygen number two, gives you a 2s as well. And that one is plus 0.69. All of these, I mean, if you think about this, right, what do you got? You got an s orbital, an s orbital, and an s orbital that all have the same sign that give you constructive overlap to give you this beautiful constructive overlap. I would argue to you, try to convince me otherwise, but that is definitely a sigma bond with S orbitals. Very, very simple. If we go up here to home minus six, I've kind of tilted the molecule here, but I think you can kind of see what's happening here. Home minus six is 26. Uh, six EV, significantly higher, right? Home minus eight is much lower than home minus six. And in this case, what do you got? You got oxygen number one and three contribute its 2s orbital, and it's what, negative 0.61. And the central oxygen number two uh, contributes a 2s, but check it out it now has a positive phase of 0 0.69. So you really see here, you've got a positive and then two negatives. So guess what we got? You called it, you called it. You've got nodes, right? Node cuts right through there and you got a node that cuts right through there. So two nodes there. And you can clearly see when you cut that, you literally have made an area of a zero electron density between two atoms that would like to bond, right? And so that's high energy, that's D state, that is the opposite of a bond. So we call that a, a sigma star, right? And that's an S because it's all S orbitals. And that's really easy to see. So again, really important. You gotta know the difference between sigma and pi. You gotta think about what's going on. High nodes, high energy, um, you know, really, really important interactions here. And now the last question I wanna kinda connect back to what we talked about before, which was a little bit of the mixing of the S and P orbitals. And is there any evidence? And for that, we need to probably look back up into carbon dioxide in terms of that MO diagram. And what I would do is just pick an orbital. I don't care, pick one. Uh, let's, let's pick this whole minus eight here and look at it. We see here that we have what? Um, we have, um, what are the major contributors? Okay, well, if we look at home minus eight, right, we said um, S, S, S. And then you say, okay, 
Where are the P's? Well, man, 0.3 versus, zero, 0.3 versus 0.1, I'll round up and be generous. That's three times as much. So I would say, I would say there's not really much mixing here. I mean, if you look at the next one, right? Here you've got 0.6 compared to 0.06. That's really no comparison. Um, you know, if, if I'm thinking about mixing, I wanna see almost one to one or pretty close to good mixing like we saw in the case of nitrogen. That's kind of the poster child. N2, go back and look at that from the lab uh, discussion from last week. Um, I just don't see much contribution here from the P's and the S's, right? It looks like really, in this case, uh, for HOMO minus eight and HOMO minus seven, the S's are dominant here. I don't really see much mixing. Um, you know, again, that that's below 0.1, really. Um, but even if you if even if you want to round that to 0.1 and say it contributed, I would say the 0.3 just blows it out of the water, right? Three to one. And then you can come down here and you can look at some other ones, right? Let's look at the home minus four here. Um, in this case, you've got the PY, the PY, the PY. Not no S contribution at all. No mixing there at all. However, if you go to home minus three, we might be able to have a discussion, right? We can say, okay, 0.3, we can round that to 0.4 and 0.2, okay? Now you could begin to tell me that, okay, you think you might see a little bit, but guess what? It's still two to one. The S orbital is twice as more involved than the, the P, so I would say still the S orbital is pretty dominant, although this one you start to see a little bit of, of, of interaction, but for, for the sake of argument, I would say to answer this final question, I, I do not see much data here to support SP mixing for ozone. Um, but again, you know, you could maybe argue differently, but I, I really just don't see uh, equal parity um, between, or parity between these. I really see in, in each case, either the S or the P really dominate. I don't see much mixing in this case. But anyway, um, you can kind of see, and you, and you might even expect that, right? Because isn't O3 dealing with the same atoms as O2? And in O2, we didn't see any mixing. And why didn't we see any mixing? Because the effective nuclear charge of oxygen is higher. So the S's and the P's separate more, and they don't really have much opportunity to mix. Um, you know, if we had done N3, which would be a fun one to do on our own, N3 um, minus actually the, the azid ion um, exists. It's actually linear, so it's a little bit different geometry, but you would, I would expect to see some mixing between S and P for that one because it would be N3 as opposed to N2. Um, but anyway, that's maybe a little bit more in depth than we need to do. So take home message. I fully expect you after all this hard work to be able to look and digest and, and process how do I look at Spartan data and how do I answer questions about it? That's really critical. And so in closing, please make sure you can do this. And at this point, you have all the information you need to be able to do the entire lab activity for this week, which is darn good review for the exam, because I promise you, there'll probably be about a, a 20 point problem dealing with Spartan on the exam. So make sure you're, you're confident in your ability to look at this Spartan data and be able to draw some conclusions, be able to um, figure things out in terms of which atomic orbitals combine to form molecular orbitals, what kind of orbitals are they? Are they homo or lumo? Are they which ones? Are they bonding, antibonding? Are they non-bonding? You know, all these kinds of things that I expected to, to, to show you at the very beginning uh, with the be able to's here, the two bullet points. Make sure you can do that. And you've had ample experience now from the lab last week, this handout in the lab this week. So please make sure to, to dig in, uh, you know, work really hard. And I will set up an office hour uh, later in the week. I don't think um, we're quite ready for an office hour. Uh, maybe I'll do one on Monday too, but um, you know, really try to digest this. It's not going to come easy. You're going to have to work for it. And you know, I think that's the Wabash way is that you want to be challenged to learn something and to, to, you know, push yourself to develop better skills. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I like to work at Wabash because I know you guys want are hungry to to better yourselves and to, to learn new things. So I hope you have enjoyed this and I hope you've taken away some new skills and don't forget the lab activities due Thursday. Um, I'll, I'll hold an office hour on, yeah, I'll hold one today and I'll hold one on Thursday to, to give you another chance. And then before you know it, it's gonna be exam time week from today. So hang in there and um, I'll catch you next time.